All right. Well, this is episode two. We're going to be talking about bodacious babes today. That's our main topic. Uh, mostly ranking women, uh, three men ranking women on a variety of criteria that we deem objective. Uh, so I don't actually know if we're going to rank them, but we'll be objectifying them. Right? Is that right? Oh my God. Yeah. Wait, can we can we go again? I don't I don't like this as an opening for an episode two. Dead bod, dead bod, dead bod. Welcome to Dad Bod History, Episode 2. I'm Eric. I'm Jake. And I'm Nick. <laughs> Popping up and, from time to time. Yes, and uh, this is Episode 2. Uh, we've got a topic about women, um, which my lawyers told me I can't talk too much about just yet. So we will get to that a little bit later, right? Yes, absolutely. So, um, welcome back. I think... Jake, you had come across something um, last week. I had come across the same thing, and that is shopping cart theory. Yes. So, before, yeah, before we get into our main topic, um, th- one of my biggest pet peeves is people at – when you go to the grocery store, you get all your stuff, you head out to the parking lot, and it's a, it's a chaotic jumble of shopping carts just left everywhere. People – can't seem to be bothered to walk their shopping cart 30 feet to the corral and put them away. And, and when you talk, it's one of the biggest pet peeves I have. Like literally I almost will judge you instantly as a person based on what you do with your shopping cart. And as well, um, you should. Yeah. And the, well, the, cause the excuses are pretty lame. Like even when you have your kids with you, it's not like they, they put the shopping cart corral on the other side of the parking lot and you're going to be out of eyesight of your car. No, they're um, pretty regular. They're regularly yeah. spaced. So, so let me, anyway, let me the, preface this because, Jake, you saw this and you commented on it. <clears throat> and I yeah. commented back. I had seen it before. So this had come from Reddit, I believe. And it basically says the shopping cart is the ultimate litmus test for whether a person is capable of self-governing. And to return the shopping cart is an easy, convenient task, and one which we all recognize is the correct, appropriate thing to do. To return the shopping cart is objectively right. There are no mm-hmm. situations other than dire emergencies in which a person is not able to return their cart. Simultaneously, it is not illegal to abandon your shopping cart. Therefore, the shopping cart represents itself as the apex example of whether a person will do what is right without being forced to do it. No one will punish you. For not returning the shopping cart, no one will fine you or kill you for not returning the shopping cart. You gain nothing by returning the shopping cart. You must return the shopping cart out of the goodness of your own heart. You must return the shopping cart because it is the right thing to do, because it is correct. Absolutely. And that was the the post, right? Yep. I I kind of. All right. So how do we feel about this? Do we? So you've got you've got your little curb that's right next to your car. Yeah. And you put your you put your infant in the car seat. And it's just you and the infant. And then the shopping cart corral is, you know, it's it's like 50 yards away. And so instead, you put the front wheels of your cart over the uh, curb next to you. You know, the little median that has one dying tree mm-hmm. in, a, in a little grass patch. And you just you, rest yeah. those you front wheels. You obviously are from cart. Arizona. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you just rest the front wheels of that cart on the grass patch. Back wheels are still, you know, off on the uh, the parking lot uh, concrete. What? How do we feel about that? Is that okay? I don't like it. No, I, I still... don't like it. My issue has I mean, more. He... My so issue has more to do with um, with the fact that when I pull into a space and there's a shopping cart in the way and it's preventing me from parking, now you have unnecessarily burden somebody else. This has nothing to do with the shop cart corralers, the guys who work at the store. Um, it, it's it's neither in their benefit or against. They have their job, but listen, you leaving your carts wherever doesn't ensure somebody a job. That's not good enough. <laughs> like I could go which smash a bunch the of windows first, tonight. Which is always like the first retort. Well, I just want to make sure they have a job. Yeah, what, like, what are we they paying They have them a job for? anyway. <laughs> well, you could be paying them to keep the store properly stocked and, and clean and all that, but no, they have to take their time to do this. Um, which all the all that cost goes to everyone else. Um, that's not that's not the the store's priority to keep those carts corralled and you know wherever. Um, now 
to be honest, this is why I park near the corral. I do go out of my way to park near the corral so that I don't have to go 50 yards with my cart. Yeah. The only time, like seriously, the only time I could think of it being an acceptable excuse is if you have your kids with you and it's so hot, which Arizona gets, and your car doesn't have a working AC or something like that where you can't, you can't guarantee your kid's safety. Otherwise, there's really no excuse not to put your shopping cart away. And, and like you said, it's, it is the litmus test for libertarianism in that sense. If, if you call yourself a libertarian, but you fail at the easiest possible example of self-governance, are you really a libertarian? Or you are, you're just not a very good one. Um, and I think that's kind of why it's so weirdly important to me is, um, is that, you know, if I say I'm one thing, I better act like it. And it's a good example for my kids that they see that their dad puts his shopping carts away or dad doesn't litter or whatever it is, you know, that dad is leading by example. Well, and I think that's <clears throat> one of the basic ideas with freedom and, and one of the arguments, uh, ag not against freedom, but one of the arguments dealing with so much freedom. It's like, hey, you have the freedom not to wear a mask, <clears throat> right? In most places, you yeah. don't have to wear a mask. Some places might ask you to, and that's their private business, and they're totally free to do so. Um, one of the issues, though, is freedom is very difficult to maintain without virtue. Mm -hmm. And if we are all, we, if we're the freest country in the world, which we aren't, but if we're going to claim to be the freest country in the world, in the United States, and the people here are not going to exercise some amount of virtue, that, that freedom can't be maintained without virtue, without people voluntarily putting restrictions and constraints on themselves and their own behaviors and actions, um, that freedom is going to go away. Because um, one of the things that totalitarian regimes do really well is they order societies that won't order themselves. So it's on the society and the individuals to order themselves in a way that, that works. Otherwise, freedom isn't going to last very long. And it starts with shopping carts, obviously. Yeah, <laughs> and if you have the conscience, this is I, I, I would I would consider myself somewhat conscientious in that um, when I go to a store, I try to park near the corral so that I don't have to be doing that extra walk. And uh, mm -hmm. that's the only place I don't do that is at Trader Joe's for some reason. They only have the one corral and it's really far away. I didn't realize that the annoying dude who's circling the lot, who I assumed was looking for a space closer to the store, was actually just trying to park in a space closer to the shopping cart corral. That's Eric. I didn't, That's, I didn't realize that guy. that guy existed. Here I am. <laughs> Here I am. So. so we want to talk about women. Moving um, on. <clears throat> well, so. you know, Eric, you came up with the title for this week being uh, Bodacious Babes, which I think is a little misleading. Considering it is. The, uh, it, it, the title it's a little podcast. misleading. I had another idea for a title. Can I just pitch oh, you the title and then we can eventually. You, you can pitch it, show? yeah. But I'm going <laughs> to. Bodacious Babes great. fits so perfectly when you realize what the topic is. Nice, nice. Well, this will be in parentheses. This will be the subtitle. Excellent. Okay. So here it is. Ready? Yeah. Bodacious Babes. Subtitle Historically Great Female Warriors. Okay, so that works. So do you understand the, the Bodacious reference, Nick? No, can you explain it to me? Uh, maybe Jake. Oh, yeah, Jake can explain it because that's his. It's his uh, baby this week. Yeah. So, um, speaking of bodacious, or if you want to look at it a different way, bodacious. Um, one of those female warriors that we're going to talk about is Boudica, and it's spelled B-O-U-D-I-C-A, which is where we came oh. up with our clever, punny little title. Um, we're so punny. And, and she was a, oh yeah, the punniest. <laughs> and she was a, a Celtic warrior um, uh, of the Iceni tribe, which was in England uh, at the time of, of the Roman occupation of England um, in 60 AD. So that's where we got the, the, the idea from. Actually, my, my lovely wife suggested talking oh. about Boudicca. Um, and then we just kind of expanded it from there to other great female warriors. Um, kind of in classical... Um, in middle age or medieval um, time. And what are your thoughts on how to go? You guys want to just talk through this like chronologically? What do you think? No, not at all. Well, we can. if We, we can go chronologically, but then um, 
So chronologically, <clears throat> there's a few different women warriors that we kind of put on a list and we started looking at. One of the names that pops up, I think for most people, is Joan of Arc. Um, right. And the, the issue with Joan of Arc, and not that there's an issue necessarily against her, but in this case, when we're looking at women warriors, we're looking for women <clears throat> who served very active roles in combat. Now, Joan of Arc, it said that she uh, took an arrow to the shoulder at one point in the battle while she was waving a flag. But Joan, um, her role in, that was a hundred years war, um, <clears throat> was as kind of a leader. And so she gave orders to troops and she kind of outlined some tactics, but she wasn't really in the field of combat. So that kind of uh, disqualifies her from this discussion. I guess we're, we're looking more for active roles of women in combat. And we did, I, I don't think there anyone on our, that we really looked into is past 1000 AD. Um, so like it, the Xena qualify? Well, uh, Xena would be yeah. if she was historically accurate, which she's not. I think, uh, you know, that also puts us in a certain demographic and age group because most, most <laughs> people under the age of 30, I think have no idea who Xena is. Xena Although, warrior yeah. princess. I, yeah, that, there's a side note there that I won't go into now, but well, and, continue. And, and, you actually kind of bring up a good point, Nick, is with a lot of these um, characters, the older or the farther back you go, um, the harder it is to separate legend from reality. Mm. And That's a great um, point. And, you know, so it, a lot of what we were looking at, we tried to find, I, I know I did and I know Eric did, um, primary sources from that time where people are recounting the actual events that these um, female characters took place in and, and what they actually did um, because much like Xena or Hercules or, you know, while there may very well have been a Hercules um, thousands of years ago, um, the, 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 his exploits grew into something that was fantastical. Um, and so it's kind of hard to separate the legend from the, the actual warrior. And that's across the, their male contemporaries too. Um, one of the women I'm, going to highlight is Lagertha, who's the wife of Ragnar, um, Lodbrok, and he's basically a, a Danish version of, of Hercules, if, if you really look at it, and it's hard to separate the truth from from the fiction. But that doesn't mean there isn't any, it's just you got to take everything that's written down with a grain of salt. All right, so we're going to go through a few, and then are we doing rankings at the end? Uh, <clears throat> so originally we had kind of talked about doing some rankings, but as we looked into it, uh, one of the things I found is there's hundreds of named women, hundreds of named women who served roles in combat throughout history, going back to like the 1200 BC, all the way up even to modern day. Um, <clears throat> and so to kind of parse them out and see, well, what, what's the criteria that you rank uh, a female warrior or any warrior on? Is it number of kills and how do you confirm that? Those, so we kind of considered ranking them, but I just don't know if that fits because I don't think we have enough information to really rank them. Um, okay. I, I would say so, that Bodicea or Bodica hits at the top just because um, she does have a high body count, but she also um, has kind of placed herself into the at least the Western psyche as a, a female warrior who who stands out and she. She's in a lot of stories. She's she's re, that that story's retold of hers. So, I mean, she almost hits number one right off the bat, just because she we can come up with her name easily. But these others are no less fierce uh, and no less um, <clears throat> ferocious as warriors, in my opinion. And some of it may be our bias being Western, as you said, is obviously we're going to identify with <clears throat> Western heroes. Whereas, in my, you know, when looking at this topic. There was um, all these um, queens and warriors from the what is now known as the Middle East. It would have been Persia or Iran or um, India and then Japan and China as well. And part of why we don't know about them is because we don't know about them. And I, I think, but if you were to go to those countries, um, they would be just as important as when we look at like uh, Bodica um, here in the West. Well, let me start with this one, um, Lady True, and and that's a Vietnamese. It's True, 
true de Trin, um, in when looking into her, she's she was called the the Vietnamese Joan of Arc, which so there's not a ton of data on her, mostly because she was involved in a, a rebellion. She was resisting the Eastern Wu occupation of Vietnam, and this is in the two. She died around 248 A.D. Um, and she led a rebellion of about 30,000 Vietnamese against this Eastern Wu occupation. And it was eventually put down. And the Chinese have no record of her because it basically like, we put down a rebellion. It doesn't matter who was at the head of it. But the Vietnamese remember her in some traditions. And so this is one of the more awkward stories. It's the basically the only story they really have of her is that she was a very large woman. And when I say large, she was tall. But they also said she had three foot long breasts that she had to tie over her shoulder or around her back. Again, that's just, that's what the story is. And she also rode an elephant into battle. Um, and that's how they remember her. And I, I think a theme that comes out in a lot of this is these women are usually rising up <clears throat> due to a, you know, there's, there's some other leadership void or there's something definitely wrong. There's an injustice. There's um, a rebellion that needs to take place. Um, that they step forward. Um, and she has this great quote, and it says, I'd like to ride storms, kill sharks in the open sea, drive out the aggressors, reconquer the country, undo the ties of serfdom, and never bend my back to be the concubine of whatever man. And like I said, that's an Asian story, and there's only this, this short snippet of her story um, that still exists to this day. Huh. Yeah. And it's, but man, that's a heck of a quote. Like, if she said that, that's awesome. And it's funny that, you know, they, we say she's the Vietnamese Joan of Arc, but she was alive in 200 AD. So really, France should be saying Joan of Arc is the French Lady, Lady True. True yeah. Right? Like, that's, <clears throat> that's how important she was to Vietnam that even 1800 years later, she's one of their great heroes. Um, and I think that's a really cool way to look at it. Um, I was just going to go ahead. Well, so I was going to say one other one from the second century was Amaj. And Amaj comes from, she's uh, Sarmatian. And uh, Sarmatia is that region north of the Black Sea. So probably in what, are, what is today uh, modern day Ukraine. And there's also the Scythians there um, in the second century. And the Scythians are very powerful. And these are all like, um, these are like horse people. Like they ride horses everywhere. That's because of the open plains. And so this is really interesting. Her story, uh, she's the, the, the wife of this, uh, this king of the Sarmatians. And they're co-rulers. And as it says, basically her husband, um, he was too much in love with luxury. So this guy was a kept man. He sat around on the couch all day. He wasn't interested in, in fighting or defending the people. Um, but she had a lot of roles in the government there. And so this, um, this group of people had been kind of harassed by the king of the Scythians. And so um, the Scythians were like, well, Amaz, she's pretty awesome. Let's make an alliance with her. And so she didn't like what they were doing. So she's like, no, stop doing what you're doing. Stop being a a jerk to those other people, um, I'm not going to make an alliance with you. And so they basically just said, you know, kind of brushed her off. So she marched, she took, her husband sat at home, she took 120 uh, men of courage, basically, um, gave them each three horses, they rode to this prince, or to this king, and, uh, you know, came upon them, basically wiped out his forces, went into his, his palace or his home there, killed the Scythian king, killed everyone in his family except for his son and basically she told him listen don't be a jerk to these people give them their land back and i'm going to leave you alone and she and she left and so she wiped out the scythian king's family except for his son and gave him a warning um while her husband sat at home eating grapes on a couch <laughs> and so that's a maj and and she it's kind of impressive to me at least yeah, and and staying kind of in I guess antiquity, um, uh, talking about um, Boudicca, and it was um, and what's nice about this story is the Romans were great at 
keeping records, even of people that they fought and conquered. Um, whereas Lady True, you know, the Chinese just said, well, yeah, we put down a rebellion. The Romans, um, you know, took note of Boudicca and they wrote about her and, and her import in, in the city of Rome. It was almost enough to make Nero pull out of England, like have him leave because of this rebellion that she had started. And the rebellion started, um, she was an Iceni queen um, in about 60 AD, and she was the wife of a king named, I'll do the best I can, uh, Prasitagus, and um, who had a long peaceful reign, and the Iceni tribe at this time was nominally independent, um, so they paid tribute to Rome. Um, but they were allowed to rule their own affairs and, and were largely left alone. But when he died, he left control of his tribe to his two daughters, Boudicca's daughters, and to Nero um, in the hopes that they would keep um, their nominal independence. And Rome did not honor that um, kind of deal that they had and instead um, started exhorting taxes, any loans that... Um, they had given to the Iceni's. They were calling them all due. Um, Roman settlers were um, abusing the Iceni's, specifically Boudicca, um, as she was the queen. They flogged her, um, or scourged her is what they say, and um, they raped his, um, her two daughters. And from this injustice, um, Boudicca was able to rally the Iceni's and uh, another neighboring tribe, the Trinovantes, and, and other uh, smaller tribes, but those were the two main ones. And from there, um, she led uh, a rebellion, and it lasted two years. Um, specifically, they, they attacked um, Camulondunum, which was um, a Roman settlement, and um, that was their first attack. They attacked it and um, burned it to the ground. And then second, they went and they fought one of the legions, the ninth legion of Hispania, and um, destroyed them. All the infantry were killed. All the Roman infantry were killed. And only some of the cavalry and um, the commander were able to escape. And so then they marched on now uh, another small Roman settlement um, called Londinium, which we now know as London. And um, the Romans evacuated, but whoever didn't evacuate, it was burned to the ground. And they said some possibly 80,000 um, Britons and Romans that were in London um, died um, at, at the behest of Boudicca's And this is army. the site, literally the site of current day London? Yeah, London Yeah, London was initially a small port and colony for discharged Roman soldiers. So when you served your oh. term, part of your pension was you were given land in newly conquered territories. And um, so Roman soldiers settled in London, and they settled in Camel, Londunum, the other one that was burned down, and um, basically Romanized the areas. Um, but yeah, modern day Lom London is um, a Roman was a Roman settlement, and um, and so anyway, she had these three just devastating attacks and three really big victories, and um, and eventually. Uh, there was a, the commander Suetonius, um, was able to rally another legion of about 10,000 men. And, um, he was wildly outnumbered, um, by the Iceni. Um, some accounts say there was hundreds of thousands of Icenis, but that was probably an exaggeration. Um, but he was outnumbered and, um, eventually, um, he, um, organized a resistance and at Watling Street, what is now known as Watling Street, which is outside of London. Um, it's kind of a, a road that cuts across Britain, east to west, and um, defeated Boudicca. And um, what happened with her afterwards is to some debate, it says she was either killed, she killed herself, like she poisoned herself because she didn't want to be taken prisoner, um, or she died of an illness shortly thereafter the battle. But... <clears throat> when she started this rebellion and here's why her story really kind of spoke to me is this quote that she has she says um this is after her husband has died this is after she's been scourged this is after her daughters have been violated and um the iceni and trinovantes are being attacked or being kind of abused she says it is not as a woman descended from noble ancestry but as one of the people 
that I am avenging lost freedom, my scourged body, the outraged chastity, chastity of my daughters. This is a woman's resolve. As for men, they may live and be slaves. And it's like such a Patrick Henry quote, like, give me liberty or give me like death. And, and she says, and, and in this quote, she's basically saying, well, me and the women, we're not going to stand for this. You men, if you want to be cowards, go ahead and, and, and live as cowards, but we're not going to do that. And, um, and it obviously worked. It got the desired effect because she got tens of thousands of people to follow her. Um, and it's just kind of an amazing call to arms um, on her part. And uh, she fought in battle. She rode a chariot and was frequently seen at the front lines, encouraging her men. And um, and uh, was just kind of uh, everything about her had this kind of commanding presence. Yeah, that's one of the, awesome. the themes that I see among a lot of these women is simply that <clears throat> their their quest is not one of glory. It's not of bloodlust. It's not of conquest. It's almost each, most of them is out of a desire to right a wrong, to fix an injustice, or mm -hmm. basically just to, to defend their homeland. Um, you know, I think the only, the only ones that I found that were, uh, not that way were the shield maidens of the Vikings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's, um, and maybe this is, you know, any famous heroic figure that makes it down to modern times as they have this, like I said, Patrick Henry type moment where they're fighting for something greater than personal gain. Um, but there's nothing to say that Boudicca didn't say this or she didn't do this or this isn't why she acted the way she did. I think we like to say a lot of people only fight for selfish reasons, but certainly in this case and, and um, with Lady True in Vietnam, they're fighting for something greater than their own personal benefit. Um, and, you know, we, we look at, like I said, Patrick Henry, or you want to take a, another example, William Wallace, and we attribute these same noble attributes to them as well. Yeah, the only, I, I guess, the only counter woman warrior I have to that is uh, Kinane. Um, <clears throat> and she was half-sister to Alexander the Great, which, uh, again, I didn't realize... You know, Philip II had like five or six wives. He had like five or six or seven kids, one of which was Canaan. And uh, she's basically of these Macedonian women. She's one of the only ones to fight on front lines. And she actually killed an Illyrian queen in battle. Um, and that's the only woman during that period who was recorded as having killed an enemy in battle. Um, and... She also, you know, once Alexander had died, she ended up trying to deal with what was left. She defeated one of Alexander's remaining armies, um, you know, and, and fighting the, one of the regents who was left. Um, so she slew uh, Caria, the Illyrian queen, with her own hand. Um, and she would have been, you know, in 330 B.C., and so that's the mm -hmm. only one that I, you know, there's, there's others who were trained up in a military, um, in a military way by their family or some other duty. Um, but in many cases, these women warriors stepped up. Um, and we have to keep in mind that their opponents um, were not all professional soldiers. Because throughout most of history, most people are not professional soldiers. The Spartans are about the only ones who are professional soldiers. Even the Romans in their legions... Um, you know, they, they raised their armies as they were needed uh, and kind of trained them along the way. They weren't um, necessarily, you know, very few were professional for a lifetime. And so for most yeah. of history, warriors are just people who picked up, put down the plowshare and picked up the sword and went off to fight for a cause and then came home when it was done. Um, so, you know, these women warriors are no different if, they see a need or the, you know, some of these cases, the man has, the man, the family is not fighting and, or for whatever reason, either they're dead or they're just choosing not to, or there's just such a great need that they, they feel the calling and they take it up. Yeah. No, I, so I, our I, first, I, our first 
uh, woman that you talked about. What was her name again? True. Lady True. Yeah. So at, at what time in in world history does she live? So she's she was at around early two hundreds AD. Uh, okay, okay. And then Alexander the Great's half sister, who we're talking about now. Would have been about, what? Yeah, should have been about six hundred years earlier. Six hundred years earlier. Interesting. Cool. Yeah. All right. Who's and up then, next? I, I, this is probably my favorite, and it's funny because I started thinking when we start this topic. I was like, it's Boudicca. She's the, she's the peak, and and she's the best. And then I just started reading about Lagertha, and I'm like, maybe not, because the more I read about Lagertha, and this is again, if you watch the show Vikings on History Channel, um, this is Ragnar's wife or one of his wives, um, and her story in the Gesta Danorum, which is the Deeds of the Dane or Chronicles of the Dane, um, written by Saxo Grammaticus. She lived about. 760 to 840 AD um, not 100% sure her birth date or death date but in the late 700s to early 800s um, and her story starts in this book as she was taken captive by a man named King Fro of Sweden who's one of the kings and, and back then kings didn't rule countries they ruled areas of Sweden and Fro had killed Seward who was Ragnar's grandfather of Norway and taken the wives of Seward's men captive and put them in a brothel. And basically the women were to be property and, and used as such um, by Fro and his men. And um, so Ragnar, avenging his grandfather Seward, um, marches his army um, to Fro in Sweden and um, lets Lagertha and the other women go. And the women, and Lagertha being the chief among them, said, well, we want to fight too. We want to avenge um, the wrongs done to us. And so what she did is um, she flew into battle and it says, this is a quote, it says, among them was Lagerda, a skilled Amazon who, though a maiden, had the courage of a man and fought in front of the, among the bravest with her hair loose over her shoulders. All marveled at her matchless deeds for her locks flying down her back betrayed that she was a woman. And it just paints this image of this of this woman dressed as a man, wielding a sword, flying into battle, um, and just, uh, and, and actually turning the tide, it says Ragnar said, declared he had gained victory by the might of one woman, her. Um, and, and he was so impressed for her, by her, he, he wooed her, he wanted to be, marry her, even though she was most likely a, a common born, she wasn't of royalty. Um, and so she played hard to get with him. And, um, she kind of tricked him and said, yeah, you can, you can woo me, come over and to my house and, and kind of we'll, we'll see what happens. And so she had a pet dog and apparently a pet bear. And she set them as guards to attack any suitors that came to her house. And so he comes to the house thinking, oh, great, she's going to, she's going to marry me. And these dog, this dog and this bear attack him. And so he has to fight them off. He has to like stab one and break the neck of the other. And then she goes, okay, well, maybe I will marry you. That's like, that was her test to him. Okay. So we're all fathers of daughters. So I think this is a good yeah. hint as to what, you know, steps we might take in the future yeah. for our daughters, give them a pet exactly. dog and a pet bear. Yeah. Listen, if you can break I mean, the bear's I've neck. A, I've already got a dog that's 200 pounds, so I'm not that far off. My dog um, it's much more effective to show off your bear than yeah. to show off your gun. Yeah, you oh, know? totally. <laughs> yeah, I was going to buy a shotgun. I think I'm just going to buy a bear. <laughs> yeah. So eventually, and here's what's funny. She married him. They had two daughters and a son. Uh, the son was named Friedleaf. And then eventually he divorced her because she was of low birth and he was going to marry a princess because he was a king. And because she tried to kill him with a bear and a dog. Like he remembered... Maybe I well, shouldn't didn't let trust that her go. too much. <laughs> yeah. And then so she eventually remarried, and, and her story comes full circle. She eventually remarried a king in Norway, um, which is where she was from. Uh, it says in this story that Ragnar was from Denmark. And uh, she still loved him and actually came to his assistance um, when he asked for aid against the Jutlanders. Um, and as queen, she brought her husband, her son, and 120 ships to aid Ragnar. And it says again... She turned the tide of the battle for him. Um, 
Match the spirit, though a delicate frame, covered by her splendid bravery and inclination to the soldiers to waver. She made a sally about and flew around the rear of the enemy, taking them unaware, and turned panic of her friends into the camp of her enemy. And so, and then she actually, um, I think it later on says that, she, uh, or no, Ragnar was able to defeat the, the king, but he would not have done so were it not for her and her assistance. And then the very next line, it says, after the battle, she had gone home, murdered her husband in the night with a spearhead, which she had hidden in her gown. Then she usurped the whole of his name and sovereignty. For the most pre presumptuous dame thought it pleasanter to rule without her husband than share the throne with him. Like, she's not and wrong. That's, she's not and that's wrong. The, <laughs> I know. That's the end of her story. You don't hear another word about her in this book. And it's just like... It's, I just think it's so awesome the way they wrote that. And, and it like I said, it's hard to separate legend from reality. But there's no reason to believe that Lagard didn't exist. There's also no reason to believe she wasn't married to Ragnar. And it, she didn't have a second husband back then. Because divorce, especially in, in the Celtic and Scandinavian tribes, was not treated the way it is now. Where it's this kind of, you marry once and then that's it. They're very, a, a lot more... I guess liberal, classically liberal with it, if you want to put it that way. Um, but just this, like, she's like, you know what? I was married before, and he divorced me and put me away. I'm not going to play that again. I'm gonna, I'm just going to take it for myself this time. And I just think it's such a great story, um, and the way it ends, especially. Yeah, and in a society that that definitely built itself on, you know, if you're the mightiest, you get to be in charge. She just mm -hmm. says, well. Okay, if that's the rule, then I'll be the mightiest. Very simple. Um, a contemporary of hers is uh, Vebiork, or Webiork, um, again, about 750 AD, and she's a Scandinavian shield maiden, which are these women who, they take up arms, and they, they get this, this term of shield maiden. Um, and uh, she has a, a much shorter story. Um, she's never hailed as royalty but she uh goes into battle um <clears throat> and uh she defeats three swedish princes and the fighter agnar um and so she is um i'm sorry they were in a war that that defeated those swedish princes so one of the warriors is a guy by the name of stark and she rushes forward to kill stark and she cuts off his jaw of all things <laughs> And he, man he manages to escape, right? So, I, again... It's a euphemism. Jaw. I, I don't know. She cuts off his jaw and just... You know, that's enough. Uh, he takes off. And um, and he escapes. And he cuts off the arm of another shield maiden named Visna. Um, and she was holding the banner. So he's like, I'm getting out of here, but I'm going to cut down the arm of this girl who's holding the banner. The banner will fall. And so Vebjorg then... Uh, described as very brave, she meets this other warrior, Thorkel the Stubborn, in a long and furious struggle. And here's the quote. It says, until Thorkel, after many wounds and much verbal arguing, arguing <laughs> finally manages to kill her. So her story is one where she dies. But it's, I, I, this quote is so interesting because after many wounds and much verbal arguing, he finally manages, manages to kill her. And I just think about how does this story come back after the battle? You know, there's some historian or scribes that will tell me about the battle. Oh, well, you know, uh, Baby Org was fighting Thorkel the Stubborn. And, uh, you know, after many wounds and much verbal arguing, uh, he killed her. He said, well, hold on. What? Verbal arguing? Yeah, yeah. They were they were talking trash to each other or they were having a dispute while they were trying to kill each other. Mm -hmm. um, again, I don't... These are the moments in history you want to go back and say, okay, what does that quote mean? What does that look like? Um are they shouting at each other? Um, do they have a history with each other of some sort that that's coming out while they're trying to chop each other's heads off? Uh, yeah. So she's another shield maiden. Um, she's uh, these are the people I'd like to meet. I think. And it's funny because from a distance. Uh, oh, definitely, definitely, well, yeah, absolutely. But it's funny because I have one more Tomo Gozen, who's a samurai during J Japan's civil war and the 1100s but um before i get into that it's like so many of these these characters and, and a lot of these classic heroes male or female they don't 
make it. Like at the end, they don't live and go on to live happily ever after. Very often they die in battle or shortly thereafter. Um, and yet they're still the hero. And I think that's such a cool dichotomy. Like you don't have to win every time to be revered. And Boudicca lost, right? The Romans won. But everybody in England still reveres Boudicca as this great heroine. Um, and, and the same thing with uh, True, Lady True in Vietnam. She lost to the Chinese, but she was still the hero. And I think that's such a cool way to look at these stories. Um, you know, and um, so Tomo goes and lived during Japan's Civil War. Um, she was a most likely a concubine or a second wife um, to Lord Minamoto. And uh, he was so impressed with her skill as an archer and warrior, he made her commander of one of his armies. And some of her stats, real quick, and I don't want to spend too much time, in one yeah, battle, get right she, to the defeated, stats, man. she defeated seven mounted warriors and collected their heads. And the article I wrote said, people revered collecting heads back then like winning Oscars today. Like, that was, Did that was a big deal. Do we, do we not yeah. do that anymore? <laughs> yeah. Um, another battle, um, she led a thousand uh, mounted uh, cavalry to victory. Um, and then uh, here's the craziest one. She had 300 samurais against 6,000. So you got like this battle of Thermopylae type Spartan 300 versus the Persian army. And she won. And she was one of only five survivors from that 300. So somehow she took out an army of 6,000 with 300 and won. And, won. and then her final battle, um, they actually lost. The, after they'd won the Civil War, the Minamoto clan had their own little war to decide who's going to lead the clan and um her concubine or her husband lord benamoto was gravely wounded he tried to get her go to the leave the battle um and she said well no let me try one more time and so she saw 30 riders coming up she found one and she goes that's the one and she challenged him to a duel again took his head afterwards and um and took that to the victory the her husband later died of his wounds, and how, what happened to her after this is kind of unknown. Um, but man, it's just such a an awesome story um, that why it's not in a Hollywood blockbuster, I don't know, because it really should be, and and all of these could be. Yeah, there's a so, lot of material here to choose from for Hollywood films right now. I mean, you've yeah. got. One we haven't talked about yet, uh, Mulan. What? Uh, yeah. How close is the actual Mulan to what was portrayed in the film? Well, I I read about Mulan, and again, this is one kind of like with Joan of Arc, where I was like, I'd like to talk about her, and and I read, and her story comes from this thing called the Battle of Hua, Ballad of Hua Mulan, and uh, basically it's a very short story poem actually. And it talks about how she there's a war going on and they call up one male from each family. Her father is too old. Her brother is too young. So she goes in her father's stead, dresses as a man um, and fights for 10 years. And actually, as other princes and generals are dying, she's rising up through the ranks and she becomes a general herself. And eventually at the end of the war, uh, this 10 or 12 year war, she... Um, is called in by the emperor and then he says, I'll give you anything you want. And all she asks for is a camel to go back home. And um, when uh, her old comrades, soldiers, brothers in arm, um, come to visit her, they realize that she's a woman. So this whole time, nobody ever knew that um, she was not a man. And so they were just shocked by it. And they asked her, let me see if I can find the quote. Um, well, I can paraphrase it as well. They asked her, well, how did you do this? And she goes, some say the male rabbit skitters from here to there while the female stays in one place. But when everything's in an uproar, how can you really tell the male from the female? Basically saying, when you have to defend yourself, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. You have to do um, it kind of in the heat of the battle. Nobody looks at what your gender is, um, which I thought was a really cool way to end that story. Yeah. You know, it's it's interesting. I think a lot of times what 
you know, the job of the historian is to learn enough about a story or an event in history that it can kind of inform you about the culture of that time and place mm-hmm. in history and like what what that means for us today and i think that's what i get the most out of all these stories is <laughs> it's so fascinating to understand like with Mul- mulan for example like what was valuable in that culture you learn a lot about that when she you know a big part of the story is her only asking she could have anything she wanted and all she wanted was a humble you know camel to take her home yeah so it's this idea of like that that's obviously a a a value you know humility and and that level of devotion is really a value well and she she did the job that was asked of her and not even the job that was asked of her it was asked of her father which you know we say, well, it's unreasonable for her to go into battle. Well, is it? Because it's unreasonable to ask her elderly father to go into battle. It's unreasonable to ask a seven-year-old boy to go into battle. Um, instead, you have a woman who's um, of a, you know, adult age saying, I'll go do it. Like, I can, I can handle a sword. I can run. I can ride a horse. I can shoot an arrow. I can do just as much. And it's just as unreasonable to ask me to do it as it is to ask my father or younger brother. And so the necessity, again, a lot of these women are, are taking up the call, not out of a desire for glory or bloodlust or, you know, wanting to go massacre people. It's, there's a need and, uh, I see that I can fill it and I have a desire to fulfill that need. Um, which usually ends up being a person who says, listen, when it's done, I just want to go home. When I did the job, send me home. You see that out of a lot of soldiers during World War II. They defeat the Germans. Germans are done. It's like, what do you want? I just want to go home. That's it. Mm-hmm. Like, just, just send me home. We're all hoping to get home at this point. Yeah. And there's that, and that's a great way, I think, to end this is that commonality. Um, you know, in all these these characters we've read, in, but in, in, you know, warriors and soldiers and and even citizen soldiers, as many of these were, as you pointed out, they just want to go home. Mulan just wanted to fight for her family. Um, Boudicca wanted to fight for her people. They just want to protect their home and they want to protect their family. And I think that's a, a universal truth that I think is is really kind of poignant. doesn't matter. And, and through time and across the globe, it, that's part of the story doesn't really change at all. No, and it doesn't have to be war. Um, yeah, <clears throat> we can look at, at the, the moment we're in right now. I'm as charged as, as it is. Um, most people are saying, what can I do to the, your initial reaction? Is, how do I take care of my family? How do I feed my family? How do I provide for my family? Uh, or how do I keep my family safe from a, a vicious disease? And, uh, you know, y- you kind of lean one way or the other. I, I really need to feed my family and, and I'm willing to risk it or, uh, my family's taken care of, and, and I'm not willing to risk it. Um, people are going to make a choice in one direction or the other to take care of the most mm-hmm. important unit in society, which is the family. Yep. And um, that's where it starts. And sometimes that means to protect my family, I have to, I have to go away, and I have to go fight. I have to go away. And I know um, <clears throat> some people in my community, doctors and nurses, were who were, had uh, some military, tra- military um, background were, were called up and said, we're going to send you to New York to assist. Mm-hmm. And then, and then they, they got recalled from that because they realized they didn't need it. But still, some people were, we're going to send you across the country to go deal with this pandemic um, because you have opted to do so. You volunteered in a way. Um, yeah. But also you're capable and that's going to protect your family in the long run. So that's a good point. And I, I guess I think it's a, a great way to kind of wrap that up. Um, right. La- last question about that. And this is just kind of like something I'm wondering about. So we're talking about the, the line between what's true and what's, you know, what's become like myth that's written into these stories. Well, just because it's myth doesn't mean it's not true. You're talking about fact and fiction. Sure. Right? Sure. So my question is, like, 
who's writing these things? Right, well, and what incentive um, do they have for making things up? And when they do make things up, what are they trying to say? I, I don't think they do make them up, but they're using the resources they have, which, especially in some of these cases, are not much. I mean, a lot of this is oral history that gets passed down. Um, Saxo Grammaticus with the Lager story, I mean, he's trying to tell the history of the Danes, and he's one of the first people writing, like writing was not something that was done back then um, mm. in in a big in a universal way the way it is today um, and so he's taking stories that he's heard from possibly different tribal or leaders or um, other historians or, or scribes that have passed it well here's something I've heard here's something I wrote down and he's trying to compile that um, same thing with Herodotus the great historian I mean he was taking legends that he heard and, and fragments of stories that he had seen or read and putting them all together. So it's not that they're lying or, or embellishing. They're just saying, well, here's what I found, and they compile it together. So Lagardere could have very well been three women, and then it all just got kind of piled under the name Lagarda. Um, Boudic, I think, is more singular in that the Romans were very good at recording um, everything that happened within the empire. Um, even their foes. Um, and, and so there's a lot more truth there. And I would say Japan as well is very good, very literate, and very good at recording all the the civil wars and stuff that they had. Um, yeah, both the Romans and the Greeks made, made it a point to record everything, even from their, not necessarily opponent's point of view, but from, you know, other happenings. So mm -hmm. both Amaj and um, Kinane, um, 600 years apart, but they're written about by Polyanus, um, who wrote, writes a book, Stratagems of War. Um, he's, he's Macedonian. He's basically trying to record what they know about these wars that have been fought. And he's living during the Roman Empire, but he's writing about the Macedonian Empire of Philip and, and Alexander. He's including Canaan. He's in, including Amaj as these people who have distinguished themselves. You know, among dozens of other people, men and women, who distinguished themselves um, in history over the past 500 years for him. Yeah. So you don't you you got you guys ha kind of have the you take the approach that the people who are writing these stories down are just doing their best, and they don't have yeah. in most cases any ulterior motives of things that they're trying to push. I mean, it, they did. I mean, like Herodotus, he was very pro. Um, Spartan when he was writing his histories and you can mm -hmm. tell he's got a anti-Athenian tilt in his writing and and um, Saxo was you know he was a Christian and the Vikings at the time were not and um, so definitely there's always a and he talks about the conversion of Denmark and the the Vikings um, towards the end of his book but I, I think they all nobody's totally objective ever um, right. but I do think a lot of what is passed on to us is is definitely a best effort um so sure sure cool well eric you uh i know um to kind of wrap things up today we're gonna do a little dad corner <laughs> yeah we can call uh, it that i like that you like that and uh so I did think it was interesting to talk about something that I think a lot of dads are thinking about uh, in this day and age. I know I'm thinking about it. We all have sons. Mm -hmm. We've got a five-year-old. Uh, Eric, you've got two. Seven and two. Jake, you've got a son. Mm-hmm. Uh, how old is he? Three? Yep. Yeah. So, uh, you know, playing football. Tackle football. Not football. Football. Uh... American yes. football, right? Like, what? How do you guys feel about that? You know, if your kid's into athletics, they want to play a little football. They get into high school. You gonna let them? Well, even before that, I mean, I know we have tackle leagues out here that start at probably nine or ten years old, maybe even earlier. Like a Pop uh, Warner thing. Yeah, I, I don't know exactly what we have in this area, but there's something in the younger ages. I think, uh, in general. Mm, my son has had many concussions already um, <laughs> through his own folly. So um, I, I think 
and I've always held this, like my, I didn't really want to play football until eighth grade. And then I did in eighth grade my freshman year. And then I tried again my junior year and, and that was it. Um, I think if, if Marcus wants to play football, um, I'm not going to let him do tackle until at least eighth grade. Um, he can do flag and, and learn how to play it that way. And if it's something he wants to pursue later, then by all means, when he's in eighth grade or high school, we can look at tackle as an option. Um, but I do think some kids are built for football. Like there's some kids where you're like, this one, he's a dozer. He can, he can take it and dish it out. Um, I don't know if my son is there yet, but, um, yeah, I, I think, uh, it's, I'm concerned, but not to the point where I would say, no, you can't do this. Um, so. Yeah. So I brought the question up because, um, I saw this article from ESPN, uh, the author's Kevin Seifert, basically why the three-point stance could become a, a football thing in the past. Now, I've never played football, tackle football, um, but as I understand it, the three-point stance puts you into a position to launch yourself forward, correct? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so Eric and I, the, just, just for the audience, Eric and I went to a high school that uh, was so small that we couldn't even support a football team. So I, I just, can't know. <laughs> we didn't have to make that decision. That's good. Right. <laughs> point is, point is, I, I, you know, I never, never, never in that position to do it. I played flag, but, um, you know, if you don't, you know, if you change this one thing about the game, is it enough to mitigate well, the issues they're seeing? So a lot the of, change? but you, a lot of modern From, NFL football, the, the, especially the um, outside linebackers and ends and, and a lot of the linemen even on the offensive side are not in three-point stances anymore. Um, your tackles are often in a two-point stance and, and your, your rushing linebackers are in a two-point stance. So they're, it's already happening um, if it becomes an actual law or a rule in the NFL. So we're saying that if you put your hand on the ground... Right. Yeah. It, it has you leaning forward, which means you're, you're pushing yourself your head. forward rather than right. actually taking a step forward. Right. Um, and you are, yeah, you're leading with your head, which, well, that'll because you always want to get you always want to get under the other guy's pads, and so the best way to do that is to put your hand on the ground and shoot up. Yeah. But by doing that, you're you're leading with your head and smashing into this other guy who's leading with his head. Whereas if you're right. in a two point stance, so just standing or in a crouch. It's by necessity you can't do that as much, right? Huh. So, but I, I don't know. I, I think in general I'm I'm okay with my son playing if once he gets to an, an age um, like high school. Yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like it's one of those things where, like you're saying, everybody's different, and you know, if if my son's like just pretty athletic and wants to play a sport i might encourage him to try some other things right mm -hmm. but if he if if he comes up he's just super passionate about football i don't know if i'm gonna take that away from him you know i don't yeah. know if i'm gonna say hey no you you can't do this one the only sport that you really love you know yeah so, i think it, mm -hmm. it um <clears throat> you know my kids ages we put my daughter in soccer like a year ago and as it turned out it was it was club soccer and she's seven she was six at the time and it was fine, like it was a club, but it was six year olds, and I thought it'd be a good opportunity for learn for her to learn. The issue was, it's like that that's putting them on a path towards this is your sport. And so when when the season was up, we we're just now we're done. We're gonna put my oldest son in t ball this spring, as far as it's supposed to start March thirty first, but that got canceled. And I was really that was gonna be like a low key, low pressure, just just play and learn the game. And, um, he's, I don't, he's going to have a tough time taking the team sports, which is why I think it needs to happen at some point because him learning the skills of dealing with, with loss, dealing with disappointment, dealing with success is something that needs to happen sooner than later because, um, it's not something he deals particularly well with right now. Um, so when that got taken away, it was kind of disappointing, but, um, you know, it's really, try something out. And I think when it comes to football, it's again, going to be when he says, I want to play football. Okay. Yeah. Well now we have that conversation and decide how to go from there. Um, I guess I would kind of lean away from it really because I don't know how many coaches really understand how well to teach 
proper safe techniques versus how many are just interested in beating up the other team. Uh, and that, I just, you know, I don't know what the coaches are like out there. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I, you know, we're talking about female warriors and female leaders. My daughter wants to play football. Now that probably changes as she gets older, but you know, at this age, she can take pop Warner league. <laughs> she could, she'd be destructive. Yeah, she she, she could, could be destructive. Uh, she you. can take most guys in basketball as it is right now. So yeah. So it's a it's an interesting yeah. it's an interesting uh, uh, Real but, quick, um, yeah. Speaking of my son, uh, the other night we were getting ready for bed, and uh, I go, Marcus, go to go to the bathroom, go potty. And he goes like, okay, and he leaves to go to the bathroom. And I'm like, thinking, I'm like, I don't think he went to the bathroom up here. I think he went to the downstairs bathroom. So I walk downstairs, and I look in the bathroom. He's not there. And I look to the back door, and the back door is <laughs> open. And I'm like, oh, my God. So I run out to the back door, and he's pulling his pants back up. And I'm like, what did you do? It's like, I went potty. And I'm like, okay, buddy. Good, good for you, man. That's And the thing is, I've never shown him how to do that. Like, that's just, I guess that's that's nature taking over. That's not a nurture thing because he's just did it. And then he's like, okay, let's go. And he went back upstairs. And it's just My son does until... the same thing. We only have <laughs> yeah. one bathroom in our house right now. And he'll he'll go. I gotta go to the potty. Runs to the bathroom. If there's anybody in there, he doesn't say anything else. He just runs out the front door. Exactly. Front door. Front door. That's awesome. So right in the yard, Even better. Pulls everything down. So. Makes things happen. <laughs> so let's say this about my my youngest son. Um, he he's an uncanny ability to remember things. Even though he you know he talks, he just doesn't say anything in English. And you know I don't he understands what you're asking and he remembers things. So we, we have two TV remotes, one TV remote, the power button doesn't work. So I order a new one and Amy, she, my wife hates the new one because the buttons don't respond to her for whatever reason. Um, so we have these two remotes and they're small. They'll like fit inside your hand. And, uh, the one goes missing and I kind of want to blame my wife. Be like, Hey, you, you, you hit it. Didn't you? I know you hate the thing. Just admit that you got rid of it. And uh, she took offense to that, surprisingly. Weird. <laughs> and so we're sitting there one day where we can't find it. Uh, it'd been like a day. And we just were like, hey, hey, buddy, do you know where the remote is? Uh-huh. The green remote? Uh-huh. Where's the green remote? Lego. So we go over to the bin. And it's just this big bin filled with all the Legos. We tried to organize it. We did some of it. <clears throat> and he points to the bin. We're like, the remote? He says, yeah. And he kind of moves some Legos around. And then I dig my hand in there. Sure enough, that thing's sitting in there. He had done that like 24 hours earlier. And remember, that's where I put the thing. That's where I put the remote. It's in the Lego bins. All somebody needs to do is ask me. Because I know where everything is in this house. He's so done this that is, more than once. This is no longer dad corner. This is brag on your son's corner. I don't All know right, if Jake, I can brag too turn. much. My son being outside. <laughs> but yeah, that's what we'll call it. <laughs> Um, so you no. think we're getting sports in the fall? Yes, you know, I do. I think I, I think it's I happening. Agree with you. I, I think the really interesting conversation is just college sports and academics in general. Yeah, like I know Cal State system. Yeah, they're not they're not doing fall classes on campus, so that's but, all Cal State school. So uh, uh, anything CS. So that's not USC. So USC would be University of California. Those, they haven't done that yet. But CS, um, there are 27 schools across the state. Um, no on-campus school for 2020. It's like, what you get to, are you going to have a football program? Are you going to start and your then, basketball program, volleyball? Like, what? how does that fit in? On top of that, we've got a situation where next year, college athletes are going to be allowed to make money off of endorsements and their their likeness and their name. So this is the, the NCAA's time. attempt. The coronavirus is the NCAA's attempt to prevent their athletes from making money. I, see, somebody's behind <laughs> this, right? Yeah, I think it's the NCAA. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the like the NBA's G League, which is kind of like their their minor league, right? It's their oh, 
There, I, I, it's summer now. It's summer now. I come in every night. I'm like, I, I want to turn an NBA game on. And oh. it's killing me. There needs to be a playoff game, and I, and I can't. There's nothing. But check this out. The G League is now offering uh, top prospects coming out of high school as much as half a million dollars a year to play. So there's already two top prospects that are not going to college. And Which is not fine because I think it's great. In soccer. Yeah, um, it's, it's that's the, how they do it. Yeah. So I, I don't have a. I think that's fine. I think if 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 you're good enough to get paid to play, then do go. It. Yeah. You can always go back to school later. Mm-hmm. Especially with your 500 grand. Yeah. Yeah, that'll pay for at least a year of college now. <laughs> but yeah. what does that do to college sports? Does it? You know, I feel like. Especially with college basketball, it used to be like that was the second best league in the world for a long time. And now I don't even think it's the third best because the Euro League and some other leagues around the world are, are, are so advanced and great. But what is I mean, what is college? You're basketball still you're still become? getting college basketball is still getting more. Uh, more coverage than Euro League and in any other league. So here, yeah, nobody cares about American college basketball outside of. The US. I, I, I think it. There's the great thing about college sports is even if the summer league or G League, whatever you call it, can do that for some, um, those kids coming out of high school are still going to be competing against other professionals who are not just coming out of high school. Um, yeah, and there's and there's going to be. You know, there's dozens and dozens of colleges that will give you a scholarship. And if you can monetize in college now, um, there's definitely going to be, there's always going to be an incentive to play in college. Um, That's true. Even even if it's not as initially lucrative as going to the G League. Sure, that's true. You've got all these big name programs still that if they do allow kids to make money, they can really... Turn things around, exactly. potentially. Interesting, gentlemen. All right. Well, I think that's time. Not yeah. over time. Hey, would you, how'd you want to end this, Jake? I, I didn't have a quote for today. Um, but what? You can find us at Dadbot History on uh, on YouTube and Instagram. And i uh, got History by Jake on Twitter and Instagram. And Antiquitous Eric on Twitter and Instagram. And we're now on uh, Spotify and iTunes, correct? <laughs> Dead by.